Chapter 47 Ellen couldn't see Carol Braverman's face because she had on large black sunglasses and a hot pink visor, but she still felt a tingle of excitement at the sight of her. Carol got out of the car, tall and shapely in a white cotton tank top and an old-school tennis skirt. Pink pom-poms wiggled from the backs of her sisters on your right. A loud buzz sounded, and she yanked on the door and let herself inside. A slim, attractive woman with dark curly hair emerged from the office and strode toward her with a smile, extending a hand. Welcome to Bridges. I'm Janice Davis, the assistant director. She looked pretty in a pink cotton top, white pants, and light blue flats. Ellen shook her hand. I'm Karen Volpe, and I thought I'd stop in to see your school. Of course. Did you have an appointment? No, I'm sorry. Ellen was wondering if Carol was in one of the classrooms. My husband and I haven't moved down yet, and I wanted to see the preschools in the area. I see. Janice checked her watch, a slim gold one. I don't have time now for the meeting we'd like to give with the tour. Let's make an appointment and you can return. I'm not sure when I can get back. Can you give me the quick version of the tour? We can chat as we walk. Sure, okay. Janice smiled. You must be from New York. Works for me. How did you know? Everything's quicker. You live here a week and your pace will slow down. The softness of her tone took the sting from her words, as did a hostess wave toward the hallway. I'll show you our classrooms and our media center. You have your own library and a preschool? We all know how important reading and libraries are, and modesty aside, Bridges is the best preschool in South Florida, if not the entire state. We draw from three different counties. Janice went into lecture mode. Now, when are you moving down? We're not sure... Ellen scanned the hallway ahead, which was empty, with classrooms off to the side, five in all, their doors closed. She wondered which one contained Carol. My son is three, and we like to be prepared to do things in advance. You'd need to for us. Janice stopped at the first door. This is our classroom for two-year-olds, the ones who stay later, that is. We like to mix them with the older children, too, so they get the socialization that's so vital, especially for our onlys. Onlys? Yes, her name is Carol Braverman, and she worked at Disney World. She was Snow White. Of course she was. Is her child in the class? No. Carol just comes to read to the children. Janice paused. She doesn't have a child in the class. Ellen couldn't ask a follow-up without blowing her cover. That's very nice of her to do that. I guess you pay her very well. Oh, she won't take a dime for it. Carol does it because she loves children. Come with me. Janice took Ellen by the elbow and led her back up the hall. It's actually a terrible tragedy. Carol's little boy, Timothy, was kidnapped a couple of years ago, and they never got him back. That first year, she was a mess, depressed, in hell. But she pulled herself together and decided that it actually helps her healing process to be around children. Ellen felt a wave of guilt. How can she do that? I would find that so painful. I agree with you, but do you want to know what she said to me when I asked her that very question? Favoritism, and I don't want to have to let you go. Regret freighted his tone, but Ellen straightened up, determined. There's no reason to do that. Not yet. I'm still away, and that buys us a few days. I have to get clear of this situation. What situation? Marcello asked, a new urgency in his voice. But all of a sudden, the white jaguar was pulling out of the Braverman's driveway and turning left toward the main drag. Uh, hold on. Ellen tucked the blackberry in her neck, twisted on the car's ignition, and hit the gas. She launched herself into rush hour traffic, an overheated lineup of blaring music, cigarette smoke, and cell phone conversations. She couldn't afford to let too much space get between her and Carol. Ellen, are you there? Marcello, hang on a sec. Please, tell me what is going on. I can help you. Sorry, but this isn't the best time for me, and she lost her train of thought because Carol took an unexpected right turn before the causeway. Ellen steered her car into the right lane, but the movement dislodged her blackberry, which slid off her lap and fell near the gas pedal. She rooted through the rest of the trash, but there was nothing yucky enough to contain Carol's DNA. She tied the drawstring tightly so it wouldn't stink up the car and hoisted the bag into the back seat with the other. She took off for the hotel and threw the trash in a dumpster on the way.
When she finally reached her hotel room, she checked her email. Amy Martin hadn't written yet, but her sister Cheryl had. And her email brought the worst news imaginable. Chapter 53 Ellen felt as if she had been punched in the stomach. She sank slowly onto the quilted bedspread, staring at her glowing blackberry screen. The email from Cheryl had no subject line, and it read, Dear Ellen, I'm sorry to tell you that yesterday we found out that Amy passed away. She died of a heroin overdose in her apartment in Brigantine on Saturday. Her wake will be Tuesday night, but there will be a private one for the family before her burial on Wednesday at 10 o'clock in Stotesville at the Cruzane Funeral Home. My mother- Oh? Who are your cousins? Yellow Visor asked pleasantly. The Vaughns? Ellen answered without hesitation. Earlier this morning, she had driven down Brightside about eight blocks away and picked a name from one of the mailboxes. June and Tom Vaughn, do you know them? No, sorry, Brightside's a little too far over. Yellow Visor cocked her head, eyeing Ellen with confusion. So why are you walking here and not there? Uh, there's a big dog on that street, and I'm afraid of dogs. I agree with you, we're cat people. Yellow Visor nodded. Mail gets picked up around 11 o'clock in the morning. I'm Phyllis, and you're welcome to walk with us if you're all alone. Thanks, I appreciate that. Ellen hoped to pump them for information until Carol mailed a letter, or her DNA otherwise fell out of the sky. Good, we like new faces. We've been walking every day two miles for the past six years, and we're sick of each other. Phyllis laughed, and her friend in the baseball cap nudged her. Speak for yourself, Phil. You're not sick of me, I'm sick of you. She looked at Ellen with a warm smile. At me before. I hate that. Me too, Linda said. Me three, Ellen said, and they all laughed again. But she was watching the Braverman house as they walked by, looking past the yellow ribbons and the Timothy Memorial and the curtains. Inside was Carol Braverman, and Ellen needed her DNA. Today. Chapter 55 the sky began to cloud over, cutting the temperature, and Ellen sat low in the driver's seat of the car with the window open, watching the Braverman house. It was 10.36 a.m., but there'd been no sign of Carol, and the red flag on her mailbox was still down. Ellen was still hoping that she'd mail a letter. She checked her Blackberry, and Marcello hadn't emailed or called. She wondered if she still had a job to go back to, or a crush. Please tell me what is going on. I can help you. She kept an eye on the house and straightened up as a mail truck appeared on the main drag and began stopping at the houses, delivering packets of mail. No sign of Carol with an envelope to be mailed, and now it was too late. The mail truck turned onto Surfside, traveled up the street on the right side, and delivered the mail to the Braverman house. Damn. Ellen felt on edge, hot and testy. She sipped warm juice, then dug in her purse for the notes from the DNA test, reminding herself of the sample possibilities. Gum, soda can, cigarette butt, blah, blah, blah. She tossed the list aside and glanced back at the Braverman's house, where there was finally some activity. Carol was stepping out the front door. Ellen's senses sprang to alert. She couldn't keep waiting for something to happen. She had to make something happen. She got out of the car in her sunglasses and visor and went into her I'm-just-a-walker routine, strolling across the main drag and entering Surfside. She walked slowly, staying on the opposite side of the street, as Carol walked from the front door and disappeared into the garage. Ellen cut her pace, taking smaller steps, and the next minute, Carol came out of the garage, daughter Carol, and she works with the children every Wednesday and Friday morning. She understands all aspects of children's theater, and even directs a play a year. Well, that's wonderful. Ellen's chest tightened and she looked away from the portrait, hiding her emotion. If Will was really Timothy, then Bertrand Charbonneau would be his great-grandfather and Richard Charbonneau his grandfather. Will would be part of a wonderful family, born to extraordinary wealth. She thought ahead to the day she'd get the DNA results, when she'd have to make a decision, or not. You'll have to make a choice I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Will that be all? the woman asked, cocking her head. Yes, thanks, Ellen answered, turning away. She said another goodbye, walked from the room, and hurried out the entrance hall to the door. By the time she hit the walkway, 
Her pace picked up from a light jog to a full-out run, and her footfalls crunched the seashells. She wanted to forget Charbonneau House, Charbonneau Drive, and her DNA samples, which would answer a question she never wanted the old man shot back, and the line shifted forward an inch. Her gaze drifted back to the first-class line, where a pretty redhead had just arrived rolling a Louis Vuitton bag behind her, her head held high. She looked vaguely familiar, and when she dug in a black purse, Ellen remembered where she had seen her before. It was the young woman who lived across the street from Carol Braverman. Her name is Kelly Scott, and her family has more money than God. Ellen watched the redhead fan herself with some papers, looking sexy in black stilettos and a cobalt blue dress, whose bold color stood out among the Miami pastels. Businessmen passing by gave her more than a second glance, running their eyes over her body and shapely legs. The line shifted, and Ellen moved up. Another businessman strode past her, carrying a lightweight bag and moving so quickly that his tailored sport jacket blew open. He joined the end of the first-class line, and Ellen looked over. She recognized him instantly, stunned.